Okay. <laughs> if you have a Bible and you want to follow along, you can. Chapter 7, verses 1 through 25. That's going to be our main text. But, you know, Jesus always told his disciples, you have to be wary of the leaven. That when leaven gets into a product, it, 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 uh, it manufactures itself in every aspect of that product. And so we always struggle with sin. And Paul is addressing that issue. The Romans certainly struggled with the sin issue, and Paul needed to say a word about it. They didn't know anything about uh, the Apostle Paul other than the fact that he sent them a letter. He had never been there, had never gotten there. But four years before his death, he made it to Rome. And he talked to them. And he spent a lot of time with the Christians in Rome after he was in prison for quite some time. And so he talks to us about this thing called sin. Our scripture passage is Romans 7, 1 through 25. But I want to give us a life application principle first. The Lord Jesus Christ has given Christians everlasting victory over sin and death. Now, you need to understand that Christ has given us everlasting victory over sin and death. Thank God we also get to see that Jesus is the answer for our struggles with sin. How many of you have never sinned? Want to raise your hand? Oh. I think we're going to miss a bunch of sinners and liars, honey. We've got to watch this place. Kleptomaniacs here. No, we all struggle with sin. Some more than others. But we do struggle with it. Had a good pastor friend who believed in being sinless perfection. Not committing any sin. And he struggled with it all the time. Trying to stay above board. I told him that was noble and good, but it's going to drive him crazy if he kept trying to do that. So Paul addresses the issue. And I directed his attention to chapter 7 because it, it, would, it would literally speak to his issue concerning sinless perfection. And so we have this. So let's look at the scripture itself. Uh, go to the next one. We're going to come back to this. Let's look at this one. Or do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know the law. And that's very clear who he's speaking to. He's speaking to religious leaders who know the law. That the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. So then if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. So Paul is just quoting what the law says. The law says if a woman uh, uh, goes and lives with another man, her husband is alive, then she's committing adultery. But if she knocks him off, she's no longer committing adultery, she's just committing murder. <laughs> the law covers every area of life. It does. It affects everything that we do. And I tell folks all the time, if you believe that you have to obey every stitch of the law, you've got about 125 books of the Torah to deal with. And out of those books, you have to keep every single interpretation of law. So if you live by the law, guess what? You're going to die by the law. That's why we need grace. That's why we need the Lord Jesus to get us beyond that. Because we don't want to be held bound to that. Now, does it mean that we give up on the Ten Commandments? No, we need the guidance that the commandments give us. But not necessarily the whole law as the Jews have established it. But the Ten Commandments become our guide for living. The sacrifices became, become our guide for living. Because the sacrifices tell us what Christ did. You know, like in Leviticus, there are five uh, Five, five laws concerning the sacrifice. One was a seed grain offering. Jesus is our offering that's crushed beneath the seed and he died for our sins. The drink offering. He poured out his blood that we might be made whole and alive again. There's so many of these things that we can look to. So we look to the Old Testament as a guide, but not so much as a standard, a total standard for living because we can't keep everything. You just have to understand that. And so Paul says that the Lord Jesus Christ uh, saves us from this kind of thing. And you have to be aware of that. 
And we have people who want so desperately to live by the law. And I tell them, you live by the law, you die by the law, you'll be judged by the law. Now let's go back. What the apostle, what God is telling us, God wants us to see the crucial death of our Lord. And he does that by talking about the law. So go back to the next page and then go over one more. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ. Ah, so you die to the law. Did you not know that? No. You die to the law and you do so by giving your life to Christ because Jesus fulfilled every part of it. And that's how he takes care of us. Uh, so, so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. And that's our key. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which, we aroused, which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now I have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of spirit and not in oldness of the letter. So what Paul is saying there is, when you give your life to Christ, you're not bound by the law because Christ fulfilled that and you die to the law. Remember Romans 3.23? The wages of sin is death. That's because of the law. The law uh, talks to us about our sin. When we look at the law, it becomes our guide. We are sinners. But the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is what? Eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so over Romans 5 eight, you have God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet in our sin, Christ died for us. Christ releases us from the law. Now, should we keep it? Yes. We should try our best. Are we able to do that? No. It's not a big deal. You just go to Christ, you confess it as sin, and he forgives you of your sin, and you just move on. Here's a life application principle. God can take any life full of sin, full of regret, full of failure, and God can transform that mess into a life full of fruit for His glory. That's what He does. He takes our wreck of a human being and He remakes us. Paul put it like this. He said, if any man be in Christ, he is a new, well, King James says new creature. Proper translation says, if anybody, if anybody be in Christ, he is a new creature. Creation, he's made all over again. The old is past. Behold, the new has come. And so Christ becomes that fulfillment in our lives. It's so perfect, so good. And so he takes care of us. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ absolutely sets us free. That's what he does. You're not, you don't have to worry about it. You, you live your life the best you can under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. You do what the Holy Spirit tells you. He guides you through life and you are set free. Next. But God also wants us to see Paul's defense of God's law. Now he defends it. He talks to us about the problem with it, but now he defends it. What he says is this, Romans 7, 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. Be on the contrary. I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would have not known about it, known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. And so this verse just, just reaffirms everything that we've said. That the law is our teacher. The Holy Spirit is our guide. And we learn right and wrong through the law. When you look at the Ten Commandments, you know what right and wrong is. When you, read to, when you uh, follow the Holy Spirit, He leads you to abundant living. And that's what you do. You know things are wrong because your heart and your mind tell you they're wrong. And so you, you begin to live in, in the Spirit. This verse reminds us that the law is our teacher. God's law teaches us how desperately we need the cross of Jesus. God's law is perfect. Even so, God's law can never save us. Can never save us. It will take us straight to hell if we just keep the law. It's like the young man came to Jesus one day and said, Lord, what must I do? to inherit eternal life. And Jesus went through a whole list of commandments. And he said, oh, but master, all these things have I done for my youth up. And Jesus said, go, sell what you have, give to the poor, and you shall have riches in heaven. 
What was the man's problem? Pride. And pride destroyed him. He went away sad for he had great possessions. Nixon. In verse 8 it says, But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind, for apart from the law, sin is dead. So when you give your heart to Christ, sin dies. It, you, you don't, you've heard me say this before, I'll say it again. Some of you may get it. You are not, once you give your life to Christ, you are not a sinner saved by grace. You're no longer a sinner saved by grace. You're a Christian who has been saved by grace who chooses to sin. That's the difference. In your old life, we've been made new. We've been made afresh. We're new people. The old life is dead, so you're not a sinner. But you do choose to sin. Why? Well, Paul will tell us in a minute. You war in your body with these things. These things are always at war. The devil's trying to get you to go back. Jesus is trying to pull you forward. And they're always warring in your life. They do that all the time. Uh, 9 and 10. I was once alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin became alive in me and I died. And this commandment, which was, was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. We need Jesus because our sin is deadly. Our sin will take us straight to hell. It's deadly apart from Christ. Next one. We need Jesus because our sin deceives us. It not only takes us to hell, but it deceives us. It makes us feel like we're okay. Paul said in Romans 7, 11, For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and it killed me. That's what it does. That's what sin does. Next one. 12 and 13. So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous and good. Therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be. Rather, it was sin in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good. So that, so that through the commandment, sin would be utterly sinful. So you have the commandments that teaches you what sin is. And, they want, and he wants you to be uh, subject to that commandment all the time. And he knows you can't do it. Because if you violate one, sin, one of those commandments, Jesus said, you violated everything. You violated it all. So it's going to be your death if you try to follow it. And he's talking about spiritual death. That's what it's going to be. We need Jesus because sin takes advantage of God's good law to kill me. Then he wants us also to see the difficulties we face with sin. These are some of the difficulties we face with sin. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold into bondage to sin. I think it, uh, that word into is in the locative case in the Greek text, and it means location. But I really believe it would have been better to say, I think it's King James that says it this way too, better to say under. I am under bondage. I am under bondage to sin. It's like a heavy weight. You remember a few weeks ago I taught you about, about the kabod, the weighty glory of God, how heavy it was, and what, what we have to do to be able to take the glory of God into our lives. Well, this is the same thing. Sin was sold, uh, we, we were sold under the bondage to sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing that I hate. Sounds like Paul's having a little battle there, doesn't it? Yeah. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good of doing the good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do. But I practice the very evil that I do not want. But I am doing the very thing I do, do not want. I no longer, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. 
He's got a real battle going on in his life. I find then the principle, and that principle is concerning sin. I find then that the principle of sin, uh, that, that evil is present in me. The one who wants to do good, the one who wants to do good, well, it, it's, it's hard when you have evil present in you. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. But I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind, and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Paul is fighting a real battle. He knows what his life was like before he, he became a Christian. He knows he persecuted the Christians. He knows he killed many Christians. He knows he, he waged war against Christians. Now he's having the same battle in his life because he knows that the sin that's there will kill him. But Christ gives him life. Next one. Matthew 26, 41, Jesus said to them, Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Amen to that. Yeah, Jesus is just telling us, be, be careful. Don't, don't even entertain it. Because the, uh, the spirit wants to take you on in, in the walk with God, but the flesh will kill you every time. It'll shoot you down. It'll do that. John Newton. You, you know John Newton? Which hymn did he write? Amazing Grace, yeah. This is what he said. I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I want to be. I am not what I hope to be in another world. But thank God, I am not what I used to be. And by the grace of God, I am that I am. How about that? John Newton was a, tra a slave trader for many years. And then he encountered Christ. And he fought many battles in England to free the slaves. But he had this battle going on. <clears throat> so we have all these things. God wants us to see the difficulties we face with sin. But God also wants us to see the deliverance we have from our Savior. He wants to deliver us from this bondage of sin. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of sin. But on the other hand, with my flesh, the law of sin. He's serving the law of, uh, the law of God. But on the other hand, it's the law of sin. And this battle goes on in his life, on and on and on. And so Paul talks very plainly about our struggle with sin. We, ha we have to deal with it. And, the, and so the question is, how do you get over this struggle? How do you get over the struggle? By staying in the Word of God. You have to stay in the Word of God. I had a conference call in Brazil yesterday with a young man who talked to me about this very subject. And I told him, you have to stay in the Word of God every day. You struggle with sin because you're not in the Word of God. You've got to follow His leadership. You've got to stay with Jesus. You've got to walk with Jesus. You have to live with Jesus. You have to hear from Jesus. And then I told him, tell me about your devotional life. What do you do when you have a devotion? He said, well, I, uh, I sing my songs. I pray. And then I read the word. No, he said, I sing my songs. I read the word. And then I pray. And I said, you're doing it backwards. You see, the Bible is God's love letter to us. He writes it to us. This is our letter. So you, you sing. You, you, uh, uh, say it out loud. You pray. <laughs> Thank you. She's my helper. And then you, uh, then you uh, read the Word. Because the Word is God speaking to us. And God will never, ever, 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 ever say something to you that's against His Word. The Word is always true. It's always true. And He will never do anything contrary to His Word. And I told him that. And he said, wow. He said, I never thought about that. I said, try it. In the morning when you do your devotional time, sing for five minutes. 
Pray for five minutes. Open up your heart. God knows it anyway. Just open up your heart. And then get into the Word and see what He says to you about what you've prayed about. And God will open up a whole new world to you. He said, wow. He said, I never looked at it like that. I said, well, you can't go back to the old way now because you already know. You go back to the old way, you slip back. You already know what you're supposed to do. It's so good. I tell you, these, these guys in Brazil, they call us all the time, talk to us. We love to talk to them. And so we just try to help them along. You and I that's had the benefit of Christianity for many years, sometimes we forget what all we have to go through to walk with Christ. We forget. And so, and, but we know better. A preacher stands up here, he preaches the word, amen. But then we lose it again because we've been with it for so much. We don't want to forget God's awesome word. Amen? Amen. amen? amen. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for my friends. I thank you for those that are watching by way of video. I pray that you'll bless their lives in a special way. I pray for those that are in this room that you will pour out your blessing upon them in a way never thought possible. Father, we just want to glorify your name. The law shows us where we've fallen short, but the Holy Spirit shows us how to live for you. And we thank you that you've given us your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right.